Hello everybody. My name's Martha Lambert and I work for Ely Library Service. It's my pleasure to welcome Rudy Page, who's going to do the second in our series of talks, Overcoming Unseen Barriers. Today, we're going to look at health and all the different inequalities that exist and also what we can do ourselves to overcome these barriers. Rudy has over 40 years experience working in health and across the business world. So um, be prepared to um, be challenged, to learn and discover what we can do. So I'm going to pass over to Rudy and first of all, ask him to tell us a little bit about his journey, about how he decided to work in business and what made him feel that he wanted to work in the equalities field. Thank you very much, Martha, and good evening, everyone. Yes, it's been a long journey. So yes, I, I call it uh, 40 years in the making, overcoming unseen barriers. So the 40 years reflects my business and development uh, as a youngster, starting, first of all, born in London, father from Jamaica, mother from Montserrat. Um, we moved out of London, I used to live in the Finsbury Park area to Slough. So I, I see myself very much as a Slough man, as we used to say in the old days. And, uh, and so I've always lived, I lived all around Buckinghamshire basically grew up there. And so still spent a lot of time in London though. So, um, so growing up in the 60s, 70s, so I put it in this order, trauma, football, reggae. There would be three key words growing up here in the UK. So um, the, the reality of being a child of the Windrush generation, so growing up with prejudice and discrimination, that, that, was, just, that was just a given. It wasn't, it wasn't illegal in those days. There was no legislation. That, that's just how it is. So I have been fortunate to be one of those who were able to separate that discrimination, prejudice, separate it from my goals and ambitions and objectives. So I've always been objective driven. So the, the topic this evening um, around health equalities for both the workforce and communities is part of the overall picture of somebody that works across many sectors. I was just looking at it today and I actually work across 10 different sectors actually. Um, and I have done for quite a few years. But um, I'm glad we're focusing on, on health first, just because of the environment that we're in today, which is um, the post pandemic era. And um, so it's going to take a new type of leadership to, to, to reduce the inequalities. But, but that will also be based on what has gone in the past. And we have to provide what we call system thinking. So I'm not a clinician. So I'm a practitioner that thinks about how can we make the system work better. So the, the areas of discussion today then will be around the communities and also around the workforce and the kind of work that I've done. So to by profession then, I'm a what's called a um, a policy implementation specialist. So this is in the area of management consultancy. So what we do, people like myself, as a research-based consultant, so we can we read research reports, look at the recommendations, and then we're able to work out how to actually implement that program. Because delivery is key for changing and transforming people's lives. And I've developed a number of systems over the years that are tailored specifically to the area of activity that I might be involved in. So it's based on a framework. So as a policy implementation consultant, what my approach to the system I've developed is we talk about policies 
actions, remedies. So we say read the policies, observe the actions, apply the remedies. So it's very, very clear. It's, it's not by chance uh, how, how, we, how we deliver. So, That's very interesting, uh, yeah. Rudy. Um, I just was wondering, um, during the um, first lockdown and, and now, there was a lot of focus on inequalities, mm -hmm. especially in the Black, African-Caribbean and Asian communities. Yeah. And I was wondering, I mean, obviously from your experience, why do you think um, these equalities started and why, more importantly, they continued mm -hmm. to the present day? Yeah, th there's some systemic and structural issues that most people don't realize. So. If you look at, um, if, if you look, right, so when we, in this country, from a policy perspective, we talk about Black, Asian, minority, ethnic. So that, that's a general term. But, so, but you have to look at the population groups. So if we, so within that, we would talk about the African Caribbean population group in particular, which we're, we're from. So if you take the NHS and social care in generally, 60% um, of hands-on care that's delivered is delivered by people from within the African and Caribbean population group in particular. I'm being very specific de deliberately. So that's 60%. And then of that 60% in that all those mixed together communities, 80% actually come from the African Caribbean population groups. So you have a high level of frontline staff and, and that accounted for much of the, um, the, 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 the transmission. And then of course, those same people um, have families so in those early days that there wasn't that focus on on the on the transmission from health workers into communities and then at the same time the public health messages around communities and um hadn't got through yet in terms of um not having gatherings and things like that so and, and that 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 hard hit many communities actually where people were gathered. So it wasn't just uh, people from the African Caribbean cult, uh, population groups. But yeah, it's, it's been at the front line that, um, and, and, and in the early days as well, the personal protection equipment, the frontline workers weren't the priority as well. That was one of the issues as well. So that's, that's kind of the reality that, uh, different population groups face and in particular African Caribbean groups. Do you feel it was uh, something that was systemic then that what that affected um, the Caribbean and black communities, particularly was when we started looking at the, the figures and the people that were dying and everyone could see for themselves? Why was it it took that long for management and people to to realize this problem well it, it, going back to my point it, it's that's a reality that is the reality and it has been the the health service um african caribbean people have been frontline workers since they started to come here in large numbers in the 1960s that's that's just the reality i mean i mean one of the key things probably for us to think about increasingly is that how can we um, in future um, do something about taking care of ourselves? Because for many years, there's been myself and others who've actually said that we should be doing more to take care of ourselves within the health system. So not just work in it, but as a community, listen to the public health messages, improve diet, nutrition, and think of, and, and actually collaborate with each other more we have a lot of clinicians within our, within our community but lots of doctors so that's not the issue so it's not that the level of education is not there so it's it's um 
what are we going to do in the future, I guess, is the question. So, and we can't just sit back and, and uh, wait for anybody to deliver us from these challenges. So some of it has to be our responsibility. And with a friend of mine, Richard Davis, we spend a lot of time between March and up to now working on collaborating and working on ways to improve the community information, trying to get radio stations to link up together, trying to get more people to collaborate. So in there has to be some personal and community responsibility towards um, improving the health inequalities. Thank you. Um, I noticed in your career that you chose to work with a lot of the major what we'd call sort of institutions yeah. of our society. Yeah. And I sort of wondered why you felt that you wanted to work perhaps within the sort of mainstream um, institutions. Is that something that you recognize? Or is yes. that something that I've just paid <laughs> up? <laughs> you, in fact, I, I'm, I'm glad you actually recognize that because um, it's a long time ago, um, right? So. As a management consultant originally, so when I moved from international marketing into management consulting, I worked in Harlesden Town Centre, and that was regeneration area. And I could see in terms of impacting communities, where, where there was a lot, a lot of inequalities, it was in how the system was run, how things were organised. And I realized that if you're not, if you're not organized in a collective manner, and if you just have individuals trying to work on their own, you, you just don't have a great enough impact. And if you're not around the table where decisions are taken, and if you don't understand what the policies are, if you don't read the policies, you don't interpret them, then you can't make any major impact. So it was around that time that I realized that um, that was an area that I was interested in. And that was because having had the background of, we've spoken about this before, working for Dyke and Dryden, which you know, the largest black company in the eighties. So again, I understood about marketing and systems and being organized and having an impact and influencing the consumer, but you have to do it in a systematic organized way. And it's something that you have to think about. It doesn't just happen. You have to think, plan, and then implement. So as I move from regeneration, which we'll, I think we'll, that's the theme of the next talk, so I won't go too much into that. But because I was, a, I was successful in regeneration and then I was invited to work with the Royal College of Nursing, and, and that was about the uh, improving the treatment of uh, Black, Asian and minority staff within the institution itself, in that they should have a greater representative voice, but also how they're treated in the workforce within their employees, employers, primarily NHS trusts. And so again, I realized that the only way that I could really assist is to actually understand how the institution work, how the system works. And then, and then within that, the develop programs that enables you to influence influence change, transformational change. So with the RCN, I ran workshops in London, Newcastle, Glasgow, Belfast, Mid Wales, and then worked very closely with different teams within, within the workforce itself. Then I realized being in, working on equalities and reducing inequalities with the workforce, I realized that again, yes, there are structural issues and, and they, will, they were there before we arrived, and those like structural issues will be there after we're all gone from here. So you then have to say, okay, given that this is the situation that we're in, well, what do we do here? What do we do from here? How do we improve our lives from here? How do we ensure that the community gets the information it needs? And a lot of that is about how we collaborate within ourselves. And there isn't actually anybody stopping us from collaborating with ourselves. It does take a mindset shift and we have to reduce what I call the self-inflicted wounding, which is and the rivalry. But we do have a lot of people who, who, who do think that way. So there's a lot of collaboration 
you know, across our community. It's just that it's, it's just it's not recognised. So the impression is given that we don't collaborate within ourselves. But a lot of things, a lot of work has been done. A lot of health promotion has been done. You know, Bev is online here. Sonia's online as well. I guess you'll hear from them later. But I can give some very specific instances. Um, if you take uh, blood donation within this country, over the last 10 years, there's been quite a lot of us from the Caribbean community promoting blood donation and, and facilitating and encouraging people to give blood. You, you might not hear of it. In the media, you'll always hear that the community doesn't give enough blood. And that is true if you think as it relates to people with sickle cell. And it's important that more people within the community do give blood. But for instance, you know, uh, through our collective efforts, there's four mobile blood collection units that have been donated through the NHS, facilitated through the diaspora groups, you know, to Antigua and Barbuda, Grenada, Jamaica, St. Lucia. Hundreds of thousands and millions of pounds of medical equipment and accessories and devices has been donated through the community here and many, many hours of um, uh, free community development information, advice and guidance about reducing prostate cancer. Um, you know, one of the programs we did, we, we distributed 17,000 bags of the top five cancer information. We ran workshops, British Heart Foundation, books on healthy eating, we distributed 15,000 of those books around the country. So a, a, lot, a lot of things have, have been done by the community and it's important, but you can only do that scale of activity if it's, if it's organized in a systematic way and it can only be done through collaboration. Okay, uh, I just want to unpack a little bit about what you were saying yeah. because you, um, you worked at a very high level, you did a lot of policies, how did you find when you sort of approached some of these organizations were they happy to see you did you experience um racism within yeah. some of these organizations yourself when you're trying to implement major policy change how did you deal with some of the issues you as a uh, you know somebody working in that field right. good question um again it's down to the mindset Yes, there's always going to be racism, discrimination. And if you, you can be humiliated by it and reduced by it, if you're, you know, if some people are, but some of us aren't. And I'm one of those people that, because as I mentioned at the beginning, I, I'm objective driven. So I'm not really concerned what somebody might think about me in terms of their perception of, perception of me when they see me. But I, I know what I, I'm there to do and I will get done what gets what I need to do. So sometimes it does work in your favor to be underestimated by people. And, uh, and that does continue to today. But it, and it happens all over. I mean, one of the approaches I have in terms of um, a lot of the work that I've done in the NHS have has been because there has been complaints about discrimination amongst staff, then part of my role is to work out what's happened and also make recommendations for transformation and improving the situation. And many times I will turn up and people will say, oh, is it just you? Where's your team, you know? And I just say, yeah, it's just me but I know it won't be long before they understand that, because I understand how the system works, that I, I ensure that there is a systematic approach and uh, the objectives will be achieved. And that's why I've, I've won quite a few awards over the years or helped facilitate other groups that have won awards as it relates to this area. So it's just being clear and knowing what the policies are and how to implement them from a system. Because an institution, an institution is just uh, people 
ideas, resources. So there's nothing special. You go into any of the institutions, there's nothing special about them, really. So, it's, so the thing is, it's not, it's not to fear, not to fear rejection, not to fear being underestimated, but be very clear on what your goals are, the purpose. Do you feel then that's something that um, that we all, the uh, when I say all the individuals or organisations or groups that we all need to learn is how not to be defeated when we go in, you know, when we when we're faced perhaps with racism or we're trying to implement change and people get fed up or the, and they say oh there's no point mm. how do you get over past that attitude where people say oh there's, there's there's no point doing it because nothing will change yeah and that's a good point and some people do that and that's why i go back to um the point when i said earlier on that there's nothing stopping us from collaborating within ourselves because in our community we have people at all levels who are willing and capable to work out how to get out of a particular crisis. But one of the key things, and we've seen it in the last few months as it relates to COVID, where there's been lots of online meetings and what's been missing in terms of us not yet seeing a clear plan, particularly from the African Caribbean population group, is because as a group of people, the, at the end of the day, you have to agree a consensus it's as simple as that. So if there's a crisis and there's a group of you trying to sort yourself, work out how to get out of that crisis, then you, you have to reach a consensus and then agree some leadership and management actions that can be translated into workable plans. Now, we have people who are capable of doing that within our community. It's just, again, it's, are we willing to uh, listen to each other and collaborate with each other? There's nothing stopping us at all. And, and the future meeting, we'll be talking about the Commonwealth and the wider Caribbean diaspora, and you're gonna find it's the, same, it's the same thing in terms of dealing with the Caribbean countries and the diaspora. There's actually nothing stopping those countries in the Caribbean. English speaking Caribbean, what we would call the Commonwealth Caribbean, which is the English speaking islands plus um, Belize and Guyana on the mainland. There's nothing stopping them Collabor collaborating within themselves and then collaborating with us here who, who live in the UK. And, and that's the challenge that is, is, is working out amongst ourselves. So, so you so you feel that there should be perhaps more of a, a dialogue between um, ourselves and across the world, talking to you know countries who have got the same sort of values and and attitudes that we have. How do you how would you see that happening? Would that be something? That Absolutely. The I mean, that's such a good way you put it, Martha, because it's something that we have done. So first of all. Um, when, when you're trying to work your way out of a crisis, there's a simple line that the first line we use is all voices must be heard. So not just the, the people who are the stars or people who've got positions or professor this or doctor that, all, all, all voices must be heard. And again, going back to what I said about the mobile blood collection units and the whole medical equipment, um, one of the reasons that the um, work that we did around that, there was, a, there was a link with the Caribbean and there was a link here because what we did, we, we worked with the high commissions to help facilitate the movement of those units and equipment to those countries. But then at the same time, the high commissioners uh, and their staff worked with us to promote the um, blood donation um, program here. And also we use the service organizations like uh, Kiwanis is a good example, which has um, sort of business people and professional people in. So we were able to, to 
promote something that the Caribbean needed. And then we had the support from the Caribbean here to, to, to um, promote blood donation. So it, it has been done and it can be done. That's one simple example. You're on mute, Martha. Yes, I just realised. <laughs> how, how, how do you feel um, going forward? Mm. What, what do you see would be the future, um, for, for especially for younger people going into health, into management? How yeah. do you feel, what, what, um, what skills will they need? And what, uh, what is there out there to help them yeah. to yeah. overcome the, their barriers? And that's a good point, the skills that they need. One of the other roles I've had for quite a few years is that I, I worked with the appointment, the appointments commission for a few years, and um, and that's making senior ministerial and senior appointments. And one of the things that I I, I did notice or have noticed over the years is that we have a lot of people who are who have the executive skills, but um, they 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 need the non-executive skills. And one of the best way to gain those non-executive skills is to actually work for charities, smaller charities, help set up community organizations and, and then mentor and mentor those people. And particularly at the moment, mental health um, is gonna be a major uh, point for us to deal with over the next year or two, next two years. And we, we've yet to really start to, to deal with that and, and that, that we definitely need new organisations and a new way of working to address the issues relating to, to mental health. So my advice to young people now, particularly those who've already started a career in health in their early years would be at the same time, would be to get some experience in working in the community, serving in the community on community organisations, um, doing health promotions, actually understanding what health policy is, what public health policy is, and how and how best they can influence their peers in terms of their health, diet and nutrition. Because we, we know at the moment, again, over these next couple of years, that um, our diet and nutrition is so important because we, we, we're living longer, but what we've noticed uh, people in our communities with long-term conditions or chronic conditions are starting earlier and then and we have multiple conditions as well starting earlier so that means that coming up now is a new generation of uh clinicians who are going to have to deal with this and and we do need you know people in our community to be aware of this and we certainly need to improve improve the communications as well because what we found as well, even now still here during the COVID time, even though we've got all these multiple platforms, we're still not putting enough information, public health information into the community spaces with the platforms that we have. So we, we, need, we need to improve that as well. And, that's, and that's, that's also a good opportunity for young people as well, get used to communicating valuable information, advice and guidance to the community as it relates to their health. Also, just um, moving on from that, what can we do to dispel the inequalities in the health um, sector? I mean, we, you talked earlier on about um, people being in the lower levels and the lack of PPP, PPE in the beginning and the fact that a lot of people don't get uh, promotions what 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 do you feel we can do to improve well some of it is about ourselves are you asking me what can we do with ourselves because we we you're on mute sorry i have be very good about muting I mean, <laughs> it's, it's a mixture really i suppose because yeah. you sort of spoke a little bit about ourselves and, and having our own responsibility but yeah. maybe some of it is a little bit higher as well so i suppose there's that bit at middle management and above yeah a lot of people can manage to get to middle management yeah but they can't seem to then uh, move forward so right. what, how can we how can we address that in a yeah, yeah to, to unpack that a bit because we do have people who are in senior 
positions in the NHS and other similar institutions. And so it's not as though we don't have any. There, there, there is underrepresentation, that's true. But I still go back to the point that we, we have to find a way to collaborate within ourselves and to care about the inequalities as well. Because sometimes what happens is that people will say, well, I've made it into middle, I've made it into a senior level, and I'll keep my head down and, and just get along. And then it's left to the activists who will try to just focus on reducing inequality. So <clears throat> there's, a, there's, a, there's a high degree of what we're responsible for. And then yes, there, there are, there are um, people who do channel, channel, challenge the inequality within the system. They are there, but um, I, I don't think that we, we should be just leaving it to others where we can take care of ourselves and improve our own lives as well. Because we, we do have the talent within the community to do that. So, I mean, you, you said, I can see Sonia's, um, yeah. perhaps at the, at the end, we'll, we'll have some questions. So if you can hold on, Sonia. Um, I just wanted to um, just think about a little bit more about what you said about mm. um, people keeping their heads above, below the parapet. Yes. Why do you think that that happens if it doesn't happen? If it doesn't yeah, happen? there's, there's, um, multiple challenges here within that so somebody like, like somebody like myself can say this because i i work independently um some with some of our um community who have been able to rise up through the ranks um it it's not always a good career move that some people may think if they if they focus on equalities in particular in the environment that they're in so it, it is a challenge and we had that with um some of the responses around um covid where people were, were not who felt they they weren't able to speak out because of the position that they held even though they may have held a position that um could have provided more information into the community. So that's why we actually need more community organizations and more people who are willing to share, share their knowledge with groups so that they don't feel that they're on their own. So people, um, as they rise up through the ranks, it can be, there can be a feeling of isolation because of the lack of representation. So people are very much more guarded in terms of what they may say in public or what or what they just may pursue that's that's just the reality okay i've got one more question and then i'll um, um have the floor open for everyone else so you, everyone will get a chance to have this to have their say so really it's just to say really what do you see in 10 years time what would you like to see in the health um, sector what changes what would be your ideal 2030. 2030, which is not that far away, is it? Really, because if we look back, look how quick the last 10 years have gone. So the next 10 years. Well, I, I would, I, I hope that we will see much more um, investment from the community in its health and a greater, you know, greater um, spread of talent around the various conditions i think we need we need more we need more uh, people in the community widening their experience there's many different careers that they can go into but in particular my number one would be mental health how could we improve in 10 years time you know we we do need i i believe we need some real specialist clinics and um, retreats and well-being organizations focused on mental health and mental well-being, particularly for the African Caribbean cult, uh, population group, given the dif difficulties they've had over the last two generations and now that we have in terms of mental health. So my, my priority would, would be mental health to see uh, you know, a real transformation and um, love, compassion and, 
and uh, humanity. I think we, we need those types of institutions as it relates to mental health. So to see them, you know, large specialist units, people who've studied and, and understand how to improve the mental well-being of people of the African Caribbean population group in this country and then be able to have better links with the Caribbean itself because that sense of belonging and heritage and culture is important in the recovery of many people as well. So we need an improvement in pathways between, between the health system here and uh, in the Caribbean as well. Thank you, Rudy. Right, um, I'm going to um, open the floor now to some questions. Um, so, Rudy, if you, I think Sonia wants yes. to have a question. So, if you want to unmute, Sonia. Okay. Hello, Rudy. Hello, everybody. Thanks very much for that, Rudy. That was um, very informative, as always. Um, what I wanted to ask, um, Martha was asking some interesting questions and you were answering them, just talking a lot about systems, which I know is the title of the whole e evening. But I want to know, how do you start to build networks? Yeah. So what's the process that we, we can start, maybe a little step at a time, to start to build the networks that we need to support what you are discussing, because it seems that there isn't, everything seems to be quite fragmented. We know yeah. we've got the skill set, we've got yeah. the knowledge, we actually got everything, yeah. but we don't appear to have networks. Yes. So what would you suggest to start building networks? Yeah, and that's such a good point because that's been one of my roles for years is to facilitate networks. And um, normally, if I think back to when I've sort of been mentoring students and people as it relates to generating networks it, i say well what what is the issue that you want to resolve what is the issue that you want to address so you you basically put that you get the, a group of people together particularly if we take mental health as a good example that we want to reduce mental health inequalities or you know and so it's it's getting everybody around the table, listening to all voices. And that point I mentioned earlier on is that it's the ability in the end, to, the ability to reach a consensus within our, within ourselves on what we believe the strategic priorities should be. And, and that's the key thing. So going back to the point where I said all voices must be heard, and that's normally because everybody's got their point of view, they've got their concern about the issue that needs to be addressed. So, so I, think, I, I think that that's what it is, bringing people together, having that dialogue, and dialogue is really important, and listening to all the voices. And, and, and the values of respect is really important as well, definitely, definitely as part of that. And, and it can be done, it can be done. And, and so, um, um, just moving, to, uh, going on from what Sonia was saying, mm -hmm. do you feel then that maybe communities, as part of what what living in the community, should be setting up networks, meetings to talk about health? Because I think uh, Sonia was saying, well, how do you begin that process of yeah. building a, a network? I yeah. mean, someone's got to identify that there's a need. Cool. Yeah, and, and normally what happens is that it's a lived experience. Something happens to us, we see something, something's happened to our family. But touching back on that point and your other point as well, though, Sonia, which you're right, is that there is a, a level of professionalism that's required to help facilitate that as well. Because a lot of time you, you, there's, some, there's some guidance needed and there's um, and just the experience of being able to say to people, look, this is this is how this particular group will need. This is the environment that this group is going to meet. And if you're going to be a successful network within this particular environment, these are some of the lessons to be learned. What happened to others? But these are also some of the way of working 
these are some of the obstacles you're going to face and these are and here are some, here are some people that if you listen to their insight that will actually help you along the way so there's some facilitation going on there there's also some mentoring and there's some some coaching as well that that is really important going back to your point in terms of networks because the way uh, things are now and unless you're very, really clear what your purpose is and you understand what the policies are you're not going to get anywhere in the end and especially if you you again haven't agreed amongst yourselves what with clarity what the purpose is what's the strategic objectives you know what are the actions are going to be taken is everybody keeping to their word turning up to the meetings are they doing the things that they promised to do are they listening to each other? Are they accepting collective responsibility? So we may disagree, but we, once we reach a consensus, we get on with it. We don't keep talking about, you know, I didn't really want to do it. It's that kind of self-discipline, self and community discipline, because other population groups are doing it without making any false comparisons. And we live in a competitive world. Yeah. And that's the thing. And of course, as we know, particularly in the experience of the last two generations for Caribbean people um, because of the level of integration. So some people, they, they will say, well, I'm OK. I don't need to get involved in anything like that until something happens to them. And then they they're then looking for support within the community and wonder where it is. So again, it's how can we encourage our talented individuals to work within the community as well? And share their knowledge and insight because they've received the training many have received the training from public institutions within this country yeah. as well and, and this and this, and that's part of the conundrum that we face in terms of especially at that local neighborhood level as well that's um just one other thing Martha. i just wanted to ask you so based on everything you've just said how do we ensure we have session plan succession planning Absolutely. because You've yeah. talked about previous generations yeah. and a lot of us, you know, we are of the age, you know, my parents, I would say from Windrush and from West Africa came here in the fifties and the sixties. Yeah. So they had, they did have networks in yes. this place that, I mean, when I say networks, they work, the workable networks, yeah. you knew where to go, especially yeah. around health, to be yeah. honest, yeah. you really did. So I'm just wondering how then we were building the networks and the structures but how do we get a succession plan? Because to me, it seems that we always seem to be coming from the same base again. But we, we do know that whatever it was has happened prior yeah. because we all we all can relate to somebody. You know, we know it's there, but there doesn't seem to be the succession planning. I would really I would really would be interested to find out how I could start to, you know, doing things that I know how we could put that in place, just engaging our elders, yeah. you know, all this. Yeah knowledge yeah it, you raise a good point there sonia and in terms of community development our generation now would be we're probably the first to really think about succession planning in this way because the our parents generation windrush generation because of the hostile harsh situation that they found themselves in that yes they were close they worked together but that whole idea of passing the baton onto our generation that that was that was a big issue for that generation and in fact what we found with a lot of the organizations they kept going much too long so when our generation came along now we didn't inherit the structures and the systems and the the buildings and the community assets that we we probably should have but our generation do understand that we have to train young people and that's why in one of the other areas of work I'm involved in with Derek Clement, that we started the hair care and barbering skills clubs. Because the only way that you can success and plan is, is build the skills of the next generation and allow them to lead, and allow them to lead. And, and, and uh, I, I've yet to hear of, and I'd, be, I'd like to be proved wrong, that we have developed community organizations now, or we're de developing them, and say to young people, maybe in their 20s, right, you lead on that now. This is being handed to you. If you need assistance, come and let me know. 
And I, I'm hoping our generation have learned from what happened to us with the generation before us. I think also partly is it's, it's the people understanding um, the way that health works and the language of health yeah. and how, because um, I think a lot of people like education, they get scared, you know, if a, a health professional or a doctor says something, then they don't know how to, to deal with it. So do you feel it's that sort of language as well that puts people off? That they think, oh, I don't understand, or I won't be able to. The, the writing, the, the documents that you have to write to, to to get grants, it's all it's all too much for some people. No, no, not at all. Because we have a lot of people in our communities who are grant writers, put bids in all the time, raise hundreds of thousands of pounds. They exist within our community. And going back to Sonia's point, in that we do have to think about succession planning. That's a good thing, and, and maybe. It's something we should prioritise session planning in terms of as we're focusing on the future, really make a decision that actually we need to get some young people, the tap, those who've got the right attitude, they've got the aspiration, they're, they're willing to work hard to attain their goals and give them an opportunity. So, so in answer to your question, Sonia, it's about opportunity and just allowing that next generation and making a hard conscious decision to say, yes, a young person must lead. And that's why I believe in mentoring because I'm one of those who benefited it from myself without going back into the Dyke and Dryden world, you know, 21 being given the opportunity to be in charge or co coordinate a major exhibition. So it's that opportunity, it's what can we do? And it is challenging times, but also it's about, um, are there any young people coming through that we see that are showing that initiative they've got the attitude they're motivated even though the circumstance may be difficult and maybe they're the ones that we should be trying to identify and support so there's potential there for us to do something about it in terms of that succession plan thank you are there any other questions would anyone like to just say something Beverly, would you like to say something? Yeah, it's not a question as such. It's just going back to when Rudy first started to speak about uh, um, the six days and, um, you know, being Windrush parents and the children. I'm from that era as well. And I was brought up in rugby, which was, it's a small town, which is mostly white. It was about two or three black families and one or two Asian at the time. Mm. And um, there was a very close community there. And we found that um, in school, in school, um, we stuck together. And um, yes, we were called names and stuff like that. But we, um, we didn't go and sit in a corner and cry when we were yeah. called names yeah we would find the name to match the ones that is suited to them as well yeah. that's what we would do yeah and yeah. because of that everybody parents grew to know each other we educated we were brought up knowing how to defend ourselves in yeah. that in that in yeah. that type of environment yes. coming from because as rugby was is a very mostly it's still very much that that type of place yeah. and so for me i started off as a cadet nurse yes yeah and i moved on um after marriage and having my kids going back to, to nursing and it was a struggle with me having three kids and going back to nursing mm. you couldn't get them taking you back if you were black and you were married and had children yeah I was lucky, I, I applied to loads and loads of hospitals, but because I was black and had children, they wouldn't entertain me. Yeah. One hospital took me and it was St. James's Hospital in Ballam, yeah? So from there I moved on, but the, 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 the level in which they had nurses coming in, even into this country to be RGN, which at the time there were registered nurses, you know, general nurses, you found that they were coerced into saying, no, you will start at this level, yeah. which is EN enroll nursing. Yeah, the SCNs, is, yeah. That's right, yeah. which was the next level, like the um, auxiliary. Yeah. And a lot of nurses took it on the chin. Yeah. Because they wanted to stay in a job and they wanted to have yeah. a career. Yeah. 
Yes. It was very hard, and it still is this day, because you will find it's a very hard struggle, as Rudy has mentioned, that um, to rise to the top as a black person, as a black person in the health service system, you have to be how many times better, or you have to be canoodling, or be friends of that one, or whatever, to get there. And when we do get there, we don't help our own. We don't. Rudy, I know for one person that I know is trying to educate through the RC and he's had sessions, he's had lectures, which I've attended outside with other hospitals sending groups inside London to try and educate them and get them to look at themselves and being better persons to rise up the ladder in nursing. And it's still happening this day. I struggled to get where I had to. I, I, I didn't get to management level in my career but it's as Rudy know it's not that I didn't fight for okay. it but the lesser person who was white I was delivering the work I was teaching I was mentoring students from city university getting dyslexic students through their education to become qualified nurses yeah. but I never still and because of that I, re, I said no enough is enough I retired a bit earlier than I wanted to yeah it's a, still a hard struggle today yeah. And trying to unite as a group. The only way forward is that we don't just look at ourselves as individuals, because a lot of us, I'm black, and I know a lot of us look at ourselves as individuals and say, Oh, I'm all right, Jack. Yeah. They don't seek to educate and help their, each other and pointing them in the right direction. You do it, and you are the bad man by either your own. How the white man person, and that's the things we've got to have eyes in our head, ears at the back of our head. Don't speak, just learn how to act, you know, to save ourselves from yeah. these things happening in order to move on, yeah, with our lives. Yeah, there's a lot more I could say, but <laughs> leave it. Rudy knows, yeah, yeah, yeah Bev, and I, I understand that there's many people uh, from our community who didn't re realize their potential within the system. But then mm. you then though, Bev, when you look at the work that you've done voluntary through the Kiwanis and other community organizations, it has comp contributed to the better well-being of the community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it, it's it's a sacrifice that we, you know, some of yeah. us make, some of us don't, and that's but we do try. Yeah. Imagine how many of us is in this country as mm -hmm as um, African Caribbean or Asian. And let, it's about 4% that donates blood. But when we get sick with sickle cell, when we get stabs in, in the maternity section, labor, giving birth, bam, white women are more susceptible to bleeding to get a blood transfusion. Mm. But yet still, we went out campaigning for years since 2015, Rudy launched the, the, the blood thing with NHSBT. We worked closely with them. We were getting somewhere. We, we had to literally beg people to sign up, to donate, right? But yet still, when we get sick, we go there. And it's a shame because our blood, the person that found out that our blood were totally different it's red in color, but the, the, the new trends in it, it's totally different to the to the age to the um European. It was Dr. Dapo. Yeah. When he brought it to us, we Rudy brought him along, found him, took it up, we took it on board. We did a lot of work, but try and get the community to work with us on this. It was a big job. We went and didn't leave Cesar, they weren't interested. We we're all over the place. We really had presentations at supermarkets, had people do lots of stuff. Lots of stuff was done. They weren't interested. But we yeah. did fight yeah. and it's still ongoing. Yeah. You know? And we haven't given up. No, we haven't given up on it. Beverly, it, it, it sounds it's frustrating mm. that you're saying yeah. that it's still, still a problem yeah. uh, today. And do you think it's, exactly. it's, a, it's a cultural thing? Is, it, is there some reason why? Um, is it because we've just not been brought up to, to think about giving, giving blood and but, donating in, in the same but, way? Well, um, some of it is yeah, to do... Can I answer? Okay. Yeah, okay, I'll let you answer. Go on then. Go some on. of it is to do with religion. 
yeah? yeah. And um, in the Asian community, it's a, it was a very hard struggle to have that breakthrough with them to donate blood because you'd find that their children or the younger people would want to donate blood, but they would have to hide to go and do it, yeah, without the parents knowing or any member of the family knowing. Yeah. Then it came to it where you had to be able to get someone to um, negotiate with the the rabbi or whoever he was for the for the um, for the for their um, what do you call them their temple or their synagogue. Or what, you'd have to get someone who knows him the Ed one, to talk to him, to get in there and try and educate them, communicate with them and educate them. Right. But they were one of the first people in hospital, if they need an organ or blood, they demand it. They didn't think that they didn't sort of encourage their people to donate. They demand it. And I know from experience that's the case in my job that I had, yeah? This is it. So we need to get it out there more that it's not just, we can't just keep taking the white man blood when a child of sickle cell gets two units of your blood, she has, he or she has to get four units of the white man blood. Yeah, and her immune system is our, our immune system last longer. And yeah, we just see, got, yeah. One of the key public health messages around that is uh, it's, it's better, all the evidence is that it's better to get blood from somebody from your own ethnic group, basically. Mm. So that's why there's this continued uh, uh, promotion to encourage more people from African Caribbean mm. communities. Because it is a challenge anyway, because I don't, yeah. I think it's less than, it's only about 3% 3 3 of the whole population anyway in this country donate blood. And so when you then break it down to the population groups, they say when it comes to African Caribbean in particular and Asian groups, it's it's one percent. I mean we don't we don't really know, but that's that's the figure that's that's uh, that's banded about. So it's a difficult area anyway. And then yes, so there's there's cultural reasons, there's suspicion, there's myths, there's the uh, experience in terms of what people have faced within the health system, in terms of families relatives when they you know so it, it is a challenge there's there's a lot of barriers but again as we said earlier on but you can't give up because the best thing for for african caribbean people in the in the hospitals having operate operations uh, having babies the sicklers who need blood all the time is to have blood from their peer group and there's a lot of activity around that as well um, that they feel like an, 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 a neglected group from within the community as well. But um, And also we our that. population overall with immigration or migration or whatever, it's like four folds now to the, to the 60s when you had loads of doctors, loads of hospitals. So you didn't have many black families being, go, being assigned to one surgery. So you used to get the attention more than you use as a patient you were treated well yeah but in this day and age that you know we are we are using up resources that some of them might find that you know we won't give them the best i know but we won't give them the best but we'll give them but eventually if you've got a, a member of your family or a friend who has knowledge someone like rudy or myself who will go and say look um that's my uncle this is what's what's what they soon change their tune this is what i'm finding is happening yeah, yeah. it does happen and that's something we've got to look out and listen for Yes, we, that, that, equal, that's a whole program. Equal, yeah, equal. Quality. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. that's, that's, a, that's a whole program. That's another program yeah. on its own. And we've come yeah. to the end for this week. Yeah, it's a lot. Okay. It's right. a big subject. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Okay. So, Martha, we, we've come to the end of this program. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for that. <laughs> Those interesting questions and that. And I, and I said, you know, at the beginning that it would be a chance for us to be challenged, to learn and discover. And I think, um, Rudy, you, you uh, delivered on all of those, all those things. It's a, a, a difficult subject. It's a challenging subject. Yeah. So um, I think, you know, it's something that now is challenging all of us in, in 
in our, our families, in our work, wherever we are, to begin the debate. Because as you said, it's not just the health of people, it's everyone that needs to be involved. Uh, absolutely. Um, and COVID has uncovered that fragmentation, and that lack of communication across the community. And, and people are already saying, get ready for the next pandemic. People who in the know are saying, get ready, you know, so that means we should be thinking and planning, what are we going to do? We don't want to wait till the day before. But on a positive note, next week's um, topic, same time, Wednesday, the, the 11th of November, 6.30, we'll be talking about community economic development. So community economic development, which I know that's a subject close to Sonia's heart. So I expect to see Sonia on that one next week. And of course, as we've seen again in this pandemic, the community economic well-being is essential because of our mental health. So many of our businesses have been devastated, um, going down to zero almost, many of our businesses. So we've now got to think in this digital age, how are we now going to transfer our, our talent, knowledge, talent, skills and insight into the digital space, then having done that, translate that into economic value that will contribute to our mental and economic well-being. That is a high mountain that we are now having to climb. And again, the structures and systems um, are not there really within our community in this modern age. And we, we have to think about how we're going to develop alliances, networks, partnerships, how we're going to collaborate with ourselves, how we're going to work internationally and uh, across many sectors. So that's, that's the conundrum that we'll be talking about next week. But we'll also be looking back at what was done you know, 30, 40 years ago, because there, again, as I said at the very beginning, our community has lived in a, in a crisis and always found a way out in a creative, with creativity, communication, skills, collaboration, all those things, the partner system, you know? So we do come up with ideas. So, so next week, Martha, we're, we'll be, thinking about that. So I look forward to, to some challenging questions from you on that, on that subject next week. And obviously within there is education. And we, we, we've been talking about the 21st century skills, lifelong 21st, 20, 21st century skills. How are we going to acquire these new skills? Sonia's research has identified many women in our community between 40 and 60 years old now. That's a, that's a major priority group. How can they generate an income? Because, you know, life goes on. They may have worked most of their life, brought up children. They may have been, you know, on their own or marriage breakup or whatever, but they still have to survive. So how are they going to survive in this, in this new era? You know, what are our young people going to do? Where are they going to go to get skills? The young people coming out of school now who maybe in the last year or two have not had any schooling. So think of next year, think, think of the cohort. Imagine if you've got a child at 14 years old now and is leaving school in 18 months time, 16 years old, how much education have they really would have had in those last two critical years? Where are they gonna get a job? Where, what skills are they gonna have? So what does that mean for the community? All those things that we have to think about in terms of community development, community economic well-being, the mental well-being of the community, all, all, these, all of these things that uh, we need to have some plan for. Some really interesting mm. questions there. Mm. And I'm looking forward to the discussion next week. So, um, Sonia, you, I'm expecting to see you <laughs> next week. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Rudy, again, for bringing your experience. Sonia, you're um, on mute. So, sorry to talk over you, Martha. Oh, okay. Sonia. Sonia. Did you want to speak? Yeah, let Sonia speak and then you close. So no, 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 I was just saying thank you, everybody, Martha and Rudy and Beverly and everybody else. It's yeah. been really exciting. Thank you. All right. So you, you take up the challenge for next week? <laughs> yes, I will. Excellent. Excellent. Sorry, Martha. 
I, well, I, I think um, on, on that note, I just want to say thank you again to everybody, to you, Rudy, and um, we'll take up the challenge for next week, Wednesday at 6.30. Great. See you, Bev. And thank you, um, Bennett is in Montserrat. So, Bennett, if you Google the Montserrat Reporter, Bennett is the publisher of that. So thank you very much. And it, the weather looks very nice out there, looking through the window. <laughs> I can see the volcano from here. <laughs> Take care then. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.